Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out to see me today, and especially since it's the last in the series of talks for our International Year of Biodiversity. Um, my role at the WA Museum, I am Technical Officer for Birds, Mammals, Reptiles and Amphibians, but my main passion is birds. Uh, one of the, my passions is the history of avifauna, in particular around the Perth region, but also in the southwest. And one of the great things about working in the museum is it gives me access to all this historical data, um, old notebooks and journals from some of our very early explorers and right up until our, our current curators and past curators of ornithology. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a look through some of those changes from some of the information that is from those journals and from this historical data. We're going to have a look at some of the birds that have benefited from the changes since European settlement and we're going to have a look at some of the birds that have not done so well since European settlement. There may not be the species in here that uh, you want to hear about. I've tried to choose a few of the common species around the southwest that you might not realise have actually were not he found here before and some other ones that have changed and we're going to have to look at some of the um, more famous species of the region. Uh, this uh, region around Albany is quite um, important as you know because it's home to uh, four of uh, West Australia's endemic species. So we'll take a look at those as well. And we're also going to have a look at some research that I've been doing over the past five years into urbanisation and the effects that that has had on bird populations um, in the, on the Swan Coastal Plain. So just a quick uh, beginner's guide to biodiversity. It simply can be put down to be the uh, biology of the diversity or variety of animals in uh, an area. Uh, because I work in the West Australian Museum, I'm looking at the birds of um, Western Australia. In particular for this talk, we're just going to look on the south, uh, the southwest region. Uh, biodiversity spot hotspots, of which the southwest uh, region is one, they support 60% of all the world's plants and vertebrate animals, including fish and they require critical conservation. The reason they're called a biodiversity hotspot is because already 70% of the species in those areas have been lost. The southwest bioregion uh, composes of uh, over 350,000 square kilometres, roughly from Geraldton to Esperance. There's over 350 bird species of which, and now this slide has already become obsolete because if you've probably been listening to the news, you would have heard that we are now up to 14 endemic species in the southwest of Western Australia thanks to the reclassification of the ground parrot to be a full species instead of a subspecies. So it's great for the southwest region, it's also great for the ground parrot, but we'll have a look about that species in a little bit area, a little bit later. There's also quite a number of endemic subspecies, and the southwest region is also what's listed as a BirdLife International Endemic Bird Area. So the southwest region. We've got a, a basic map here giving our major bioregions within it. Uh, up until the, well, going back in time, back to the Eocene period, so about 40 million years ago, the Avon wheat belt actually consisted of several very large uh, river systems. However, about a million, uh, over the shifting and rifting, uh, 11 million years later of the, the lifting of the Darling Scarp, what we ended up having was the, a decreased slope, the rivers uh, were reversed, so as whereas before we used to have the saline water coming up and flowing into the rivers, they reversed, so we actually have fresh water running the other way. This uh, lifting or rifting of the Darling Scarp created a sedimentation of the rivers and lakes, and the lakes within the wheat belt became disconnected, creating small uh, salt lakes instead of flowing rivers. These salt lakes in the wheat belt region are six times as salty as seawater. They're incredibly salty. And it's been over millions of years that this has happened through periods of drought, um, rainfall and uh, evaporation creating the, the salt build up in the wheat belt. What this means though, that as Europeans have settled the land and, done, and cleared all this land, there's been a reduction in the groundwater uptake because they've cleared the, ve the uh, existing vegetation and replaced it with uh, slow uh, or low, low rooted uh, crops, and that means when it does rain, when the, wa the water there's no plants to deep rooted plants to suck up this water, so the water table rises, and as it does, it brings up the salt through the groundwater as well. Unfortunately, these salt lakes only flow when there's periods of very extreme heavy rain, and we haven't had that in quite some time. The current climate, as um, everybody's quite aware, 
we have quite reduced rainfall and increased aridity and increased um, periods of drought. So since European settlement, it was actually quite a slow start from co after uh, colonisation. It wasn't until the uh, gold rush era where people started to move out, uh, out into outer areas. There was a very high um, uh, immigration rate for people to come and uh, exploit the gold rush that things started to take off. But once it did take off, there was rapid, rapid output of agriculture and expansion into agricultural areas. Into the 19, early 1900s, there was what was called the Group Settlement Scheme. And that was developed by the Premier at the time, James Mitchell, who uh, sent out made up posters and flyers to send back to the Mother England to try and encourage people to come out to Western Australia. And this map here is actually from that planning phase, showing the areas that they wanted to colonise and create farms. I think they brought over over 6,000 people to settle the area, to give them farming land. They were given entitlements to clear land um, and bonuses. They were given government help, government funding to buy machinery and to try and help to clear this land. And during this time, from about the 1920s to about the 1930s, uh, there was over 40,000 square kilometres of land was cleared. Then we had uh, oh, the Second World War. But after the Second World War, we had another big development. And we're going to see a little bit more about that later. We had this post-war suburban development. So all the returning um, veterans that they had from the war, they were um, given jobs to build houses. So there's a lot of land clearing, building houses, creating jobs. And following that, we had the 1970s mining boom, another massive expansion of urbanisation. And then again, in the 2000s, as we all know, the stimulus package decade, and again, another mining boom, seeing uh, people wanting the great Australian dream, building homes. So the effects of European settlement, the effects are quite fast. The obvious one is land clearing. When you clear land, you're modifying the habitat, you're removing the vegetation, removing the, animal, removing the habitat the animals live. You're removing the native vegetation, you're imprinting foreign plants, that might be through crops, but it's also through uh, plants that people would rather see. Uh, if they're from Europe, they like to plant European plants and even exotic plants from uh, Eastern Australia. We have changes in the fire and water regimes, people building dams, they're creating fire to clear land. They're also creating drier habitats so lightning strikes become more frequent. And you also have things like um, arson and these days people leaving cigarette butts out windows which they, uh, the land would have had to deal with those sorts of more frequent fires. They also bring in introduced animals. So you've got rabbits, um, classic example of erosion and also competition with other mammals. you also got foxes and cats. But one of the other things that they like to bring whoops, was birds. We're going to have a look at a few of those birds in a little bit uh, later. So I did a bit of stats on the threatening processes um, of birds that have been threatened uh, since European settlement. And the two largest areas of change was the wheat belt and the Swan Coastal Plain. It's not surprising since these are the areas that underwent the most change from human settlement. The wheat belt has gained five species of bird, but it has lost nine species of bird. The Swan Coastal Plain has gained six species of bird, but has lost seven species of bird. The areas that both these regions have lost have been the Rufus tree creeper, the yellow plumed honey eater, the scarlet robin, western yellow robin, and the crested shrike tit have pretty much disappeared from both these regions. They've been pushed down into the Jarrah forest region, into the, uh, where they did previously occur already, but now they're restricted in their range. If we have a look at the threatening processes, by far the biggest threatening process is land clearing. Smaller uh, uh, threats is the loss of food, obviously that would probably be through land clearing as well, but one of the interesting case studies is the little eagle. The little eagle actually started to benefit for a while there because of the introduction of the rabbit, so it was doing quite well. But then with uh, culling of rabbits, the rabbit proof fence and um, control, uh, seeing less rabbits, the little eagle actually started to decline again and it 
stabled out for a while. A common bronze wing also uh, didn't fare too well for, through loss of food, loss of acacia seeds. And the grey currawong is an interesting one. The grey currawong uh, used to feed on, or oh, it still does, but it uh, main source of food or main prey item was a native snail. But with the introduction of the garden snail, the common brown garden snail, which outcompeted the native food, the grey currawong lost that food source. Persecution is an interesting one as well. Wedgetail eagles, Borden's black cockatoo, the western long-billed corella were all shot because they were considered to be agricultural pests. Wedgetail eagle used to be shot because it was perceived that it would actually hunt on lambs and sheep. They didn't realise that the sheep were probably already dead before the wedgetail eagle found them. Uh, Borden's black cockatoo and the western long-billed corella uh, were also shot because they uh, got into orchards and into grain crops. A common bronze wing again fed um, not too well since it was uh, found to be good eating, so it was actually hunted. Obviously, it's not done so much done, done anymore. But one of the other interesting ones and a bird that's found along the coast here and also down around Albany was the rock parrot. There are substantial populations of the rock parrot on Rottnest Island. Um, but then in the 1980s, there was quite a lot of um, taking of nests and, uh, sorry, eggs and chicks for aviculture. And the numbers of rock parrot on Rottnest Island have de uh, decreased quite significantly. It is also under threat from the coastal uh, land subdivisions for residential housing up and down north and south of the coast. So some of the birds that uh, Europeans wanted to bring with them when they moved in. This period here, the late 1800s to early 1900s, is where we have our acclimatisation committee. So their um, great contribution to West Australian avifauna. The acclimatisation committee was set up in 1989. It had two jobs. The first job was to make European settlers feel more at home, and the second job was to establish the Perth Zoo. Perth Zoo was, um, the first director was a man named Dr. Colonel Le Souf, and he brought with him uh, turtle doves since he liked the sound of their call. The ostrich was introduced because at the time uh, ostrich feathers were quite useful or quite well um, used in fashion. The Indian peafowl and the ring necked pheasant were introduced on the mainland but didn't survive. They now only occur on Rottnest Island. And the Indian peafowl, they've been culling them on Rottnest Island as well, so they probably will not be there for much longer. Um, some of the other failed species, partridges, for, were uh, introduced for hunting. Uh, Peking nightingale, again, for its call, and the skylark, which didn't survive. Several different kinds of uh, species of quail, again, for hunting. The mute swan uh, is only occurs now at Northam. And the population of Northern, I think, has got heritage listing and they actually clip the wings of the birds there so that they can't fly off. Um, but they still keep them there for heritage value. The laughing kookaburra is an interesting one. The laughing kookaburra was introduced in 1897 in an attempt to control snakes in the colony. It was introduced from over east and as we all know, the laughing kookaburra did very, very well. Not only did it eat snakes and lizards and frogs, it ate smaller birds, it ate our native mammals, it outcompeted cockatoos and parrots in nesting hollows. So the laughing kookaburra did pretty damn well out of that. Um, I've noticed though in the Perth area in the last, um, I've been living in Perth since I was born and in the last 30 years I've noticed that the laughing kookaburra has actually um, declined. And I think the laughing kookaburra on the Swan Coastal Plain is now going to be facing the same threats that are facing a lot of other hollow nesting birds. The goldfinch uh, was introduced successfully and it hung around for about uh, 70 years but in the 1970s it died out and they think it was because of uh, inbreeding and didn't have enough genetic variation from the original stock and um, they all died out. The red-browed finch, which was introduced quite late, um, there were quite good populations around the Starling Scarp area, around Pickering Brook up to Mundaring, um, and it's, it is still hanging up, but they're very, very few and far between. So that one might not be around much longer. The sulphur-crested cockatoo was introduced from uh, Avery Escapes and had been subsequently exterminated in the Perth metropolitan area. There was quite a good population of them around the Guildford area. 
um, and it's regularly shot now by agricultural department. You do still see them around, around every now and then. And then we come to our most famous one at the moment, the favourite rainbow lorikeet. Um, there are different theories on where the rainbow lorikeet came from. Uh, obviously it came from aviary escapes, but who let them out of the aviary is a bit <coughs> under debate. It has done amazingly well. It was a bit slow to start off. They sort of hang around the Nedlands King Park area for the first 15 years it was around, but in the late 1990s it just exploded. My theory for why the rainbow lorikeet exploded is because that's about the same time that the whole native garden syndrome came out where everybody wanted to plant native plants in their garden, but unfortunately the native plants that you got in at Bunnings and the soup at the um, uh, nurseries were eastern states varieties of which the rainbow lorikeet loved. So it did quite well. That extermination program for the rainbow lorikeet, I think in last year they shot 17,000 of them, um, which did cull them a bit, but they've lost since lost funding for the program, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that bird, but it is one to watch, and hopefully you don't see it down in Albany anytime soon. Some other uh, what are other things we get other than people bringing in uh, birds? We also get invasions. So as people, mod humans, mo oh, Europeans modify the habitats, we also get birds that like think, hey, this is really good. You've made a perfect habitat for us and uh, we're going to come and uh, exploit that to our own needs. One that, since I've been in Albany, I've come down today and one of the things that people have been talking to me is about the glass. Everybody said they're seeing more and more glass. And they're probably correct in this assumption. Before 19 1910, uh, galahs were not found in the southwest region at all. But after 1920, there was a rapid expansion of this species heading south. Um, and they were found, they, um, found all throughout the Swan Coastal Plain and throughout the wheat belt. They did really well from the establishment of grain crops and the establishment of dams for water. Another species very similar, the Corellas, the little Corella. Again, not seen in uh, this one on the, the south coast before 1910. Um, 19, by the 1950s, it was well established, and the 1960s and 70s, it was helped along by aviary escapes. There are two subspecies of galah in the southwest. This one here, this is the western galah, it's got a pink cap, so this is the one that's moved from the northern areas north of Geraldton down into the southwest. But you've got the white cat species and they're the ones from the, e the eastern states, they've been released from Avery, so you can tell a bit difference there, but you'll probably get a lot of um, uh, interbreeding these days as well. In contrast, the western long-billed Corella, uh, two subspecies, you've got uh, the subspecies Pastinator, which is in the south, and that has not done very well at all. That is, that is the subspecies that was uh, persecuted as a pest species. However, in the north, you've got the subspecies Butleri, and that's actually doing quite well, and they're actually having to control that subspecies because it's becoming a threat to Carnaby's cockatoo, which is breeding in the same area. This fella here, Australian white ibis, um, nobody had seen it prior to 1952. Um, once it did appear, it was incredibly rapid and expanding, um, and it is a pest in the eastern states. And it loves grain crops, it loves lawn areas, uh, the expansion of lawn areas and the introduction of uh, a lawn beetle um, has done very well for this species in particular. Our friend Crested Pigeon, another one that did very well from the um, introduction of grain crops and uh, uh, water, new water sources. It was unknown before 1900. By 1970, it spread all the way down the south coast through the wheat belt, arriving at Albany and, and uh, Ravensthorpe, and it's now well established all through the arid zone. The banded lapwing, lapwing is an interesting one. The banded lapwing was one of the first ones to colonise the area um, after agricultural development. It was first uh, not sighted in 1895, and then over 50 years' time, it had made its way all the way to Geraldton. It came up through the east, travelling from south, travelling along the Esperance uh, coast, coming up back up through the other way, uh, so dip opposite direction to the Galahs and the Corellas, coming up the south and going up. But there may also be uh, have been some uh, releases, uh, deliberate releases from the acclimatisation community um, from the South Australian Zoo. But 
we're not quite sure on the um, validity of that one. But that's one to watch the banded lapwing because if you've ever been to Eastern Australia, you would see that the masked lapwing is very common. It loves urban areas. It's on, you'll see it right in the middle of car parks, in median strips in the middle of freeways. Uh, it's very adaptable and it loves uh, Rottnest Islands, actually. That's a photo from Rottnest Island there. Some of our more common species uh, that we see everywhere uh, today were actually not very widespread at all um, prior to uh, the agricultural industry. Both the Australian magpie and the Australian magpie lark were very scarce and patchy. The mudlark was uh, restricted to waterways and creek lines. However, with the clearing of land, um, opening up of the forests and the additional water supplies, both the Australian magpie and the mudlark uh, were very fast to colonise the area and they reached Albany in about 1910-1920. The same with the yellow rump thornbill. The yellow rump thornbill uh, prefers open habitat, so um, back um, before 1890 or 1880 would have been confined to uh, open grasslands around uh, rocky outcrops. Um, now it's quite common all throughout the southwest, especially in cleared lands and open jarrah forest as well. The welcome swallow, uh, also very common, it was usually restricted to the coastal areas and has now been uh, uh, found new homes under our eaves, our culverts, our fence posts, uh, sorry, our lighting. Um, so it's, we've actually provided nesting ha habitats for it and we've also provided water sources so that it can uh, get mud to build nests. So it's done well out of that one. And actually made all its, its way all the way to the gold, uh, gold fields throughout the 1900s <coughs> as well. Two of our biggest victims, the dusky wood swallow and the rufous tree creeper. Both of them were found throughout uh, the wheat belt and the Swan Coastal Plain. Um, both are now restricted to the Jarrah forests. Uh, the dusky wood swallow did not previously occur in the Jarrah forests. It has actually invaded the Jarrah forests because of the opening up of the, the land has made it actually more suitable for it. So it's lost uh, its habitat and it's uh, found a new one. It no longer breeds in the wheat belt. And this is a species that was previously more common than the black-faced wood swallow, and the black-faced wood swallow is the one that's much more common today. So there's been a change over in species. The rufous tree creeper, uh, it was very common throughout the, uh, in the 1840s during early colonisation on the Swan Coastal Plain, but by the 1890s on the Swan Coastal Plain it was considered scarce. Um, it declined rapidly on the Darling Scarp um, in, after the 1920s, and it is now locally extinct in the wheat belt region and it was uh, considered rare on the Swan Coastal Plain and it is still found in the Jarrah Forest Belt. On to some of our more favourite, or well, not favourite, well they are favourites, but some of our more famous uh, species here and ones that you'll be very aware of down here in now Albany. But all, the, all four species that are on here were very rare uh, prior to European settlement. There are probably already forces at work forcing these birds to be uh, quite localised and very scarce. All four species are, are highly vulnerable to bushfire, so changes in fire regimes have really impacted on these species. The ground parrot as well was also rare before the um, introduction of the red fox, the European fox, but that sure did not help it at all. The Western, uh, which one are we? Uh, bristlebird. Okay, Western bristlebird. Um, it's possibly records from Perth, but there's been no records on the Swan Coastal Plain since 189, uh, sorry, 1839. Very patchy records. There's been 20 year gaps throughout history on when the bird was seen, when specimens were found. Every time a specimen was found, it was heading further and further south until it's now restricted to this very, uh, very southerly distribution. There you go. Western whipbird again uh, is extinct on the uh, western population. It's thought to be extinct on, since 1901. It's very scarce and very infrequent. And again, this is on, now only restricted to the uh, very south, southern area of the uh, southwest corner. And then our friend up here that we're going to talk about a lot more a bit later is the noisy scrub bird. Once thought extinct and rediscovered, but we'll have more on him later. Extinctions. We've had two definite extinctions. 
Uh, the Rufus bristlebird was actually very common um, or moderately common in the area where it was found and this was between Cape Lewin and Cape Naturalis. It was only discovered in 1901. The last record of the Rufus bristlebird was in 1908. So it was only known for eight years. There was one unconfirmed sighting from around Mammoth Cave, but again, that's something unconfirmed. The main threat or that caused the demise of this bird was fire, was the burning of land, clearing of land um, for agricultural region. Lewin's Rail, um, there's been no reports of Lewin's Rail since 1932. Uh, it was quite originally quite scarce already, uh, found only in the uh, far southwest corner. It's uh, fa still found in the eastern states. This photo is from uh, Canberra, but it abandons uh, its vegetation or its habitat very quickly um, if it's been modified or degraded, and in particular waterways. So this, this bird's a, a secretive rail or crake like bird, um, and any disturbance to its habitat and it doesn't do well at all. So Having a look through the historical records, I was interested in how long does it take for a species to become extinct and how long does it take for some of these changes to happen? So I've done three studies. I focused on urban areas and I focused on areas where changes was currently happening. Then I looked at a study uh, plotting changes over time from uh, in residential areas and then I plotted that against uh, changes in a, an urban area which still retained a lot of its natural vegetation. So first thing I did was make a nice messy map of uh, the Swan Coastal Plain uh, with urban development. As you can see the biggest developments was the uh, 1960s to 1980s, huge amounts of development um, all mm. around the city there. And then again, we've got our current, these blue and green areas are actually still currently being developed. And these, are, these pockets that are in white are actually, they should probably be coloured in by now. And same up the top here. So it's still continuing. Um, for some reason, we have this lovely uh, pattern coming up and down the coast here. Everybody wants to live near the beach, but nobody wants to go outside because they want to sit inside with their big screen TVs. And so why do you want to live near the beach? But you tell me. Um, <laughs> and your air conditioning, exactly. So uh, the graph down the bottom shows the uh, peaks in uh, urbanisation on the Swan Coastal Plain. So we've got the post-war boom, the 1970s mining boom and uh, our little peak here after the 1990s. Uh, what I should have done was map the bird changes as well because the peaks would have been the same. The changes in bird uh, introductions throughout the area um, actually coincide with some of those changes. Development trends. So before pre-world, we had nice small cottage style homes on big blocks. We had big backyards, but unfortunately the backyards are usually quite uh, cleared and we had trees, but we had uh, nice trees, shady trees down the streets. Uh, the gardens also usually had uh, vegetable gardens or um, fruit trees in them. We had gentrified parks uh, with lots of exotic trees in them, especially during that, um, uh, sorry, the 1920s. They liked to build um, pretty parks and put uh, pretty trees in them. But the post-war mining boom is probably uh, one of the best examples of, um, of uh, urban planning. We have large homes, but we still retain the moderate, modest uh, sized blocks. Uh, we had big backyards. And with our gardens, we retained a lot of the nat natural vegetation in our parks and gardens. So we retained a lot, especially in the Swan Coast Plain, we retained the tuits and we retained the marry trees as actually being features in our garden. They were actually, it was actually looked upon as being um, a beneficial thing. However, in the stimulus decade, we seem to have gone backwards. We've put even larger homes on even smaller blocks. We've gone back to having gentrified parks and gardens, except for this time we put concrete around our lakes. We've planted exotic trees again, so we've got ashes, ash trees and Chinese tallow trees and I don't know, some kind of rush, it's not Australian. Um, our street trees, we've got, there's an exotic street tree here. Um, front gardens are lots of lawn, there's no plants um, and all the houses are packed in one against the other. It's, I see, it looks like I see your houses out through there. 
So I wanted to see what this actually had, what, what is this actually doing to our bird life. Um, I moved into a, one of these development uh, areas back in 2002. I was part of the stimulus decade, I will admit it. I took the government's money and I built a house. But while I did, I did some research at the same time. So I looked at the, species, the bird species on my block of land from uh, when it had just been cleared up until uh, uh, what I got there, about four years after development. So after the house has been built and after the, the rest of the houses around us have, been, have gone up. As you can see, over those years there was a massive decrease in the diversity. We had a 30% loss in species in four years. There were only 18, I think I had 32 species at the beginning, I had 18 species by the end. Uh, the losses, they're all the small insectivorous birds, specialist feeders like the uh, western spinebill, the rainbow bee eater and the striated pardalote. I put the red wattle bird and the Australian magpie in there because before I presented this talk I actually went back to that area and I found that the red wattle bird and the magpie have come back to that area. So even though I didn't record them in 2006, um, in 2010, they've come back again. The additions. We have one, two, three, four introduced species on that list. Well, the other common species are seeing honey eaters, magpie likes, white cheeked honey eaters, uh, ring necked brown honey eaters, all very common species all throughout the Swan Coastal Plain. And I wanted to see if this trend continued over time. So I mapped out the region of Perth, I found out what age the suburbs and I chose uh, three suburbs north of Perth and three suburbs south of Perth of different uh, age groups, uh, sorry, suburban age groups and did some bird surveys to see how many species were there. And what we found, I'll just point out actually Carlisle. Carlisle is an interesting one, it has only recorded nine species, subspecies and Carlisle is one of the older suburbs um, in comparison to Mount Hawthorne where people have retained their big old houses. Carlisle's actually seen a lot of change since it's been developed. Um, it's constantly been had houses being knocked down and rebuilt and a lot of infill has happened. So what I found is that the trend continues. So I found in those existing uh, suburbs that 13 of the 18 uh, species that I recorded at the end of the South Lake study were also recorded in this pilot study looking at uh, the age groups of suburbs. I did not find any small of the uh, insectivores uh, that had disappeared from the South Lake study. I did not find any of those small insectivores occurring in the, uh, the, other, the existing or established suburbs. And I had five of the introduced or invasive species were uh, recorded. My top five species that I found was the rainbow lorikeet, the seeing honey eater, the red wattle bird, the mudlark and the Australian magpie. And I recorded all of those in the, uh, except for the magpie and the red wattle, but I recorded all those in the last year of the study for South Lake, and they were not recorded not in the first year of study of South Lake. So they were not recorded during the year that before uh, building had commenced. On the side, uh, I did went, I went and lived in Les Murdy for a while to try and get out of the suburbs and to try and get back to the trees. Uh, Les Murdy is a suburb, it was, uh, it actually was uh, established early in the 1900s but was not uh, developed residential housing until about the 1950s. It was actually a privately owned land up until then. But they still have very large homes but they have very large blocks as well and a very high retention of the natural vegetation, in particular the large trees and it's all surrounded by large natural reserves. On one one residential block, I recorded 31 species of bird. It retained all the small and specialist, feed, specialist feeders that were originally lost in South Lake, including the red cap parrot, the grey fantail and the western wattle bird. So you can really see that the, the vegetation has a lot to do with attracting uh, birds to uh, residential areas. So we wondered why would I bother studying this? Why would I bother looking at um, bird species and how bird species have changed? Well, if you look at museum records, we've got over 320 species of bird recorded in the, Perth, the greater Perth region. But 113 of those are rarities or one-offs, so it means that birders, birders have added them to the species list, but they're probably very unlikely to actually occur there ever again. We've got 15 pelagic seabirds, so they don't recur actually on the Swan Coastal Plain. 
got 34 of them migratory shorebirds are waders so they don't breed there and 76 of them are water birds. Now uh, lakes and uh, waterways um, have a higher biodiversity of uh, birds by nature that they're usually surrounded by um, natural vegetation so they act as havens for a lot of our, um, our bird life. So that only leaves us with 91 species for the whole of the Swan Coastal Plain. And if you take away that 43 of those are uncommon or occasional, it leaves us with only 66 um, bird species for the whole of the Swan Coastal Plain. And you can have a look here at the map I've got here. The large dots indicate the greater diversity. The smaller the dot means the lower the biodiversity. Um, and if we lay that over with uh, natural parks, you'll find that these big dots are actually wetlands. So you've got the stretch of wetlands down here from Bibra Lake, uh, Thompson's Lake coming down, and then you've got uh, uh, Lake Munga going up to Lake Joondalup up, up through there. So what are our concerns? Uh, climate change uh, has been well publicised in the media, and perhaps the biggest uh, impact that climate change is going to have is the... Uh, uh, the increase in temperature and therefore the further uh, drying out of our southwest region. Um, this will affect, not affect the birds directly, but it will affect the plants and the other animals that they feed on and therefore uh, have greater effect that way. Dieback is becoming even a uh, more serious threat as it, uh, I don't know whether anybody's um, driven past Mandurah and Pinjarra lately. Um, it's not looking too good. Um, Dieback opens up the canopy, uh, which therefore reduces uh, the shelter that the birds have. Uh, it in can increase weed species because weed species get more light. Um, there's loss of nesting hollows through um, the loss of trees. So that's one, ooh, ooh, my little mouse. one to watch out for. Uh, continued land development. Um, not so much for agricultural regions, um, that seems to have sort of halted, but urban sprawl is a really big problem, um, particularly on the Swan Coastal Plain, but uh, even down around, going around uh, Bustleton down to Mandra, uh, not Mandra, so Bustleton to Margaret River, uh, all these uh, sort of popular holiday spots that have now become urban centres for people. Um, we've really got to look at uh, how we're developing suburbs and how we're developing urban areas and invasions. Uh, the Western Australia is incredibly lucky that we do not have established colonies of European blackbird or common miner or uh, the European starling or the house sparrow. There is a small population of uh, starlings in Esperance, um, but because of a dedicated team at the Agricultural Department, we've managed to uh, keep these uh, birds out of Western Australia, and if we can continue to do so, it will be all the better for both uh, us as an economy because these uh, species create uh, incredible economic uh, catastrophe wherever they go through um, loss of uh, agricultural crops and also damage to housing and building and also because they're pests so that costs a lot of money in pest control. But also if we can keep these species out it means all the better for our birds. Is if anybody's been to Sydney or Melbourne and tried to go bird watching I guarantee that the first five species you see will be introduced species and including the turtle doves as well that are over there. So the longer we can keep those out the better. But there are positive changes as well. This isn't a whole talk about being negative. There is definitely some positive coming out of it. There's a pub growing public awareness, uh, especially um, in regards to our um, uses of water, our uses of energy. People are becoming more green or more environmentally friendly. Unfortunately, they're also becoming greater consumers, so you have to sort of weigh these things up. And the joint management programs as well. So you've got land managers working with agriculture departments who are also working with conservation departments. And the more times we can get these departments working together, the better that it's going to be for our environment. And the conservation initiatives, um, organisations uh, such as um, the DEC, organisations, so government bodies like the DEC and um, more private uh, organisations like the WWF, um, the conservation initiatives and the research that they're putting into these species, the more we can learn about them and the more land and uh, resources that we can put aside for these, uh, these birds, the better. And one of the good stories is the noisy scrub bird. And I, I was going to come back to this and I saved this to last because it's a good story, it's a feel good story. This is a species that originally was thought to be quite widespread throughout the southwest, 
but it was last sighted in 1889. It was thought to be extinct. The last sighting of it was actually 30 kilometres uh, west of here uh, at Tor Bay. But then in 1961, this is a newspaper article here, a Albany school teacher uh, heard the bird and sighted the bird at Two People's Bay. Uh, Few other, uh, after other sightings and the gentleman, the school teacher actually went out and got uh, photographs of the bird. Um, there was a big push to preserve this area around here, two people's which let, uh, became two people's nature reserve. It was going to be earmarked for a, a new town site, but the dairy discovery of the bird halted that. The area was subsequently uh, made a conservation area. Uh, which is lucky for it because that area is also home to uh, other endemic birds such as the ground parrot and the brisk bird. And in 1994, there was the rediscovery of Gilbert's Potteroo in that area. So one bird um, and the conservation of one area has led to the conservation of many other species. And there's probably untold plants and other insects and everything that also live in that area that would also be being protected. The, unfortunately, it is quite susceptible to fire but translocations for the species have been successful, so there's hope in that. And the area is uh, managed by DEC for fire as well to try and um, reduce those impacts. A single fire is meant to be able to or potentially able to reduce 50% of uh, the bristle, uh, sorry the um, scrub bird population, and it takes about three to four years for habitat to become suitable again. Uh, for that species to live. So it's really, really important that um, we support the efforts of um, some of our conservationists and some of our teams to uh, look after these species and as well as the uh, same can be said for the ground parrot as well. Um, you probably know it didn't do too well in some recent lightning fires and um, the more we can preserve areas like this, the better. So I'm going to end my talk on that um, little hope, ray of hope in our noisy scrub bird and um, hope that sometime the, the uh, same efforts can be applied to um, some of our other species as well. So thank you and I'll take questions as well. Is there a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go. Brian Mulgridge, Claire, thanks very much for your really interesting address. Uh, I posed a similar uh, question to Harry Butler when he spoke about the, um, the ibis and the uh, uh, rainbow lorikeet and uh, he said the best hope for uh, controlling them was um, he called it through breeding, um, what's it called, um, biological. Biological control. control. Yes, and I just wondered what, uh, what birds do they threaten, like is the uh, white-cheeked egret um, threatened by the um, or the white-faced heron? Yeah, you mean? Um, I don't think the white-faced heron would be. It would be other colony nesting birds that uh, would be, so egrets and cormorants. Um, the Australian white ibis is a colony breeder, and pretty much what they do is they just build masses of net nests, and it all just covers. It will cover a whole um, water area. I don't agree with Harry <laughs> in uh, the control methods. Um, the ibis loves rubbish tips and it loves human waste. And I think, and it's the same with the Australian raven. If we can better manage our, sort of some of our waste areas, I think that we could see a big reduction in uh, numbers of those species. The rainbow lorikeet's a lot more difficult. Uh, there were people calling for people to do, th do something about the rainbow lorikeet a long time ago. And I think our time has passed. Um, if we had gotten to it, when it first sort of started taking off, we could have nipped it in the butt. Um, and we probably still can, but we need the funding and we need the support of the public. And that is really hard with the rainbow lorikeet because it is a pretty bird. Um, people do not like to see it being shot. Um, the efforts to eradicate the rainbow lorikeet only started when it got into the grape crops and the wine industry started complaining and then the agriculture department said, oh, okay, now we have to do something about this because our econ economy is under threat. Yeah. And unfortunately, money talks and so that's what happened, but it was too late. Uh, Rainbow lorikeet's been found out as far as Northern and 2J now. Um, it's roosting in the Darling Scarp 
but um, they keep shooting them, so we can just. Oh, they are shooting. Yeah, um, but but they haven't got uh, the money to do what they were doing before, which was to do um, a concentrated sort of culling in certain locations where we knew that they were roosting. Yeah, there seems yeah. to be a, a marked increase in the white ibis around. Oh the yeah, they've done really well. Um, the other thing I wondered about the dung beetle. Uh, Yep. Yeah. So the dung beetle and the lawn beetle, and it's uh, actually probably got something to do with the the spread of the magpie and the Australian raven as well. We saw Australian ravens today as we um, drove out of Albany, um, flipping uh, cow pats over, getting the dung beetles out. Um, so yeah. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> Other questions? I don't think it would be because they're only subspecies, they're not uh, full species. So what it means is they're, they're still very, very closely related. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't think that that would be, I don't think that would be true. Because yeah. yeah, they, they, they breed quite readily in aviculture all the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't see it myself, but this yeah. person was quite strong on it. Yeah. Yeah, it might be a bit different though with, because uh, pink and grey galahs will hybridise with corellas as well. So they would uh, produce mule offspring. Um, pink and grey galahs also been known to uh, breed with Major Mitchell's cockatoo. And you occasionally see those around as well. So, yeah, that's yeah I think so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I noticed that today as well when we were driving through and it looks like I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the blue gum plantation practices but it looks like they strip the, the bottom understory so that the trees must put all their effort into growing up instead of growing out. Um, but what that does is it, there's, of course there's no understory for the birds. So there's nowhere for them to breed and they're certainly not going to go foraging around in there because it's open to all the predators. Um, so they're, they're, they are pretty much stellar why would Why would a bird want to be in an area where it can't hide and it can't feed? So, and I don't think the, um, some of the plantation owners like the cockies getting in there either. So, the added food source for them. Ah, oh, so like, yeah. So they started netting and poisoning and you know it, there was a lot of, con yeah. was a lot of conflict in the late 90s about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, you too. yeah. Do you know how long they take to grow? To grow? Yeah. About eight to nine years. Oh, okay. Yeah, for a, full, for a height to be um, at about the 10 year mark, they take them down because then they start seeding and yeah. where they used to think it was a sterile seed, now it's not and they can escape. So oh, it's okay. Mark yeah. Yes. Um, well, in the southwest, we've only got the white-fronted chat. There is, I think, the orange chat is in danger, but it's not in the southwest. And I'm not quite sure what the threatening process is for the orange and the yellow chat. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they are quite reduced. They have been quite restricted. I only see them around um, uh, Samphire Flats. Um, these days, so it could do with the, again, probably the clearing of the wheat belt and infilling of some of those lake areas. So, but that's, yeah, that's a good one, so I'll keep an eye out for it. I'll check that, check up on that. Yeah. Are they likely to cull out the starling in the, the starling, sorry? Yeah, cull it out in Esperance. Um, again, the public have uh, expressed, um, oh. yeah, they, they didn't want people shooting them, but they do have the... They do have the exterminators, um, so they've got paid people from the agricult agriculture department and their job is to sit there all day on the Nullarbor plane waiting for these birds and just popping them off as they come across. Um, 
And that's been an amazing effort because just to get the government to fund that is um, amazing in itself. So we just hope that they keep keep it up. Oh no, don't say. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but um, I haven't heard much about the ones in Esperance lately. Um, but last I heard, they were up against public outcry about the culling. Yeah, they wanted to go in there and get them, and they were stopped. Well, why don't they just do it? That's what I said. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I said as well. Yeah, they just, yeah, yeah. I said the public will get over it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. Some years ago, a friend and I went to we used to go to Mungabilla beach combing, and we were talking to an ATV chap there, and he said that uh, some people tip over the traps and let them out. And let them out. Yeah. And they had a, a way of uh, exterminating and find where the roost is and set a plug of jelly there. And yeah. Up, but that was too bizarre. Yeah. People couldn't handle that either. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's all about education, trying to educate people. And yeah, and it is changing the rainbow lorikeets. People are starting to realise what a problem they are. So, it's too late. yeah, it's, yeah, but it's just too late. But yeah, but if you have any other questions, you can come up and ask me afterwards. So, we'll have a chat. Yeah.